Welcome to this video that introduces the idea of null hypothesis significance testing. So one type of statistical inference is designed to compare two or more samples by testing a hypothetical null hypothesis. But regardless of the specific nature of the test, there's a general sort of philosophy that underlies a lot of, of this method. So why do we do statistical testing? Instead of just comparing the raw data, we can make some measurements of the samples. Why don't we just compare those raw numbers? Well, the data that we have represent a sample from a much larger population. So what the raw data we have, it may not be exactly like the true difference, or the true relationship, or the true result. So I like to think of statistics as the voice of reason. So it's we, we run these tests to help, us, to help prevent us from over-interpreting something that might just be random noise. So when analyzing data, there's often two things we want to know. First, and really most importantly, is what is the size of the effect that we're looking at? Is the average value in, in the green group here just a little bit bigger than the purple group or a lot bigger? Does the value of the y-axis variably increase just a little bit as the x-axis increases, or does it increase a lot? Are we looking at a small effect or a big effect? You know, we often are doing testing because we care whether an effect is important, and the size is a very meaningful part of that. So you're, you're going to learn about how we look at the size of the effect as you learn more about specific tests later on. But the second of component is our confidence that the effect even exists. And this is sort of the underpinning of hypothesis testing for statistics, and that's what the rest of this video will focus on. So as a way of testing our confidence in the existence of the effect, we set up something called the null hypothesis, often referred to as H0, or H underscore zero here. So the null hypothesis is a statement that must have some single unique outcome that we can test. And the most conventional form is that there is no difference between the groups. So, for example, the grain size is equal in the river sand and the beach sand, if we're comparing two samples like this. In theory, we could choose any unique outcome. You know, river sand is exactly twice as large. Um, but the hypothesis of no difference or equality um, is a good one because we're trying to figure out how confident we are that the effect exists. The effect is not zero. Now, we know that the null hypothesis is never going to be precisely true. The chance that these two groups are exactly the same, you know, to infinite number of decimal places, is, is impossible. So, the null hypothesis is never true, but that's not really the point. It's a hypothetical situation that we're, we're using for comparison. So, another step or component of this is that we can explicitly form an alternative hypothesis. And almost always, this is just that there is a difference. Right? Our null hypothesis is that there's no difference. Our alternative hypothesis, specifically, there is some difference, either positive or negative. We don't know whether one sample is bigger than the other, um, so we're comparing in, in either direction. But we can specifically test if one group's average or relationship or whatever is greater than the other group, or if it's less than. Um, but, and this is a very important warning, however, you can't choose your alternative hypothesis based on the data. From the photo we have here, it's pretty clear that the river sand on the left is much bigger. Um, but the alternative hypothesis must be based on a prior expectation. You can't look at the data and choose a, your alternative hypothesis based on the data. You have to choose it before you know the results based on some theory or some other knowledge. So if you have any doubt, just use a difference as your alternative hypothesis. It's what people almost always do unless you have a very good reason not to do it and it's going to be the default in all the tests in R as well. So once you have your null hypothesis you can collect the data, perform the experiment, look at the existing data, whatever you, you're doing. Uh, and the data is going to be the statistical sample. It's hopefully representative or randomly selected from the broader population that, that we care about. Uh, in many sciences, especially in the earth sciences, you're not often able to run a controlled experiment, but it's really important to consider then whether the sample you have is really representative. Could there be any biases that affect it? You know, so in our example here, you know, did we sample a representative part of these environments? You know, things like that. 
So we can collect our data, we can compare the average size, for example. But you know, even if our samples are representative and completely unbiased, they're still finite and often small random groups chosen from the population. This is why we don't just look at the raw data and compare them. Oh, this one's bigger than this one. Well, we really want to know, because of that randomness, we would expect there to be some difference. Even if the null hypothesis is true, even if they really, those two populations really did have the same size, taking two random samples, one would be bigger than the other, just randomly. So this is the main point of statistical hypothesis testing, is to determine how likely our observations would be if the null hypothesis was true. If they really were from the same population, how likely would it be to see the difference that we found in our two small samples? Technically, what we're finding is the probability of observing an outcome at least as extreme as, our null as what we saw if the null hypothesis is true. Now, we'll say that in, in, a sec in another way in a second here. So that outcome, that output, is called the p-value. So the p-value is the probability of obtaining a result at least as extreme. So let's say we found a difference in grain size of 2.5. Our p-value is what would be the probability of observing a difference of at least 2.5 or bigger, or negative 2.5 or smaller, or we're looking in either direction. We didn't know if one was bigger than the other to start with. So we're looking to see what is the probability of observing a result at least as extreme as we did in either direction, assuming our null hypothesis is true. So if the two samples did come from the same population, i.e. they had the same size, which is our null hypothesis, what's the probability of observing a difference in mean or average size at least as big as the one we did? So the p-value is not the probability that the null hypothesis is true. It's not the probability that this result occurred randomly or by chance. So that's really important. The p-value is this really kind of weird and counterintuitive thing. It's the probability of obtaining our result if the null hypothesis was true. But it does tell you something. It tells you in something indirectly about how likely the null hypothesis might be. We're not testing the hypothesis itself, but if the p-value is very small, if it was extremely unlikely to find our result, or something more extreme than our result, if the null hypothesis was true, then we might infer that the null hypothesis perhaps isn't very likely to be true. So the p-value, although it's weird, it's an important part of our sort of decision-making process in this type of statistical hypothesis testing, because it helps guide our confidence in, in the effect. But the p-value itself is just a probability. It doesn't itself help us make decisions on its own. We need to pair it with something called alpha, or the significance level. And so alpha is a threshold, which means that if the p-value is smaller than or equal to alpha, we would say that the null hypothesis is probably not very likely, so we can safely reject it and say, no, we don't think that's likely. The question is, what should we choose for alpha? And what are the implications of that choice? Well, consider this, this matrix, this, this two columns and two rows. The rows in the left, on, in blue, indicate sort of two possible states of reality. We can never know which of these is really true, but in reality, we should either reject the null hypothesis or we shouldn't reject it. The columns, which are in black on the top there, are the two possible decisions we will make or can make. We can either reject it or we won't reject it. And so we reject it if the p-value is smaller than or equal to alpha. So two of these possibilities end up correctly reflecting reality, but the other two are erroneous conclusions. So for example, we could set alpha at a really large value, say 0.5. We could say, oh, as long as there's less than a 50% chance of observing this observation that we have assuming the null hypothesis is true, we'll reject it. Well, if we do that, we're going to reject a lot of null hypotheses. And we might do so even when we shouldn't have. And so that's called a type 1 error. It's basically a false positive. We rejected it even though we shouldn't have rejected it. 
And that's actually not a really good thing. In contrast, you know, we could be very, very strict. We could say we're only going to reject the null hypothesis when the probability of observing a particular outcome is really small, say one in a thousand or something like that. Well, in this case, we're not going to reject many null hypotheses, but we're going to get the alternative possibility where we should have rejected it, but we don't. So we're missing out on something that perhaps is a meaningful or, or significant difference. So there's a lot of history behind this, but to make a long story short, kind of the completely arbitrary but conventional choice for our significance level of alpha is 0.05. So if p is less than or equal to 0.05, we will reject the null hypothesis. If it is greater than 0.05, we won't reject the null hypothesis. Now, there's another sort of important and kind of counterintuitive point here. If we set this to 0.05, this does not mean that only only 5% of our tests will be false positives. We might actually have more than that, because it depends on something called statistical power, which we'll talk about later, and also, surprisingly, on the probability that the effect is even real in the first place, which we can never know. So, p-value is a little bit weird. It's sort of this decision-making metric that's conventionally used. Anyhow, keeping all that in mind, the final step is to sort of compare our results, the p-value, to our chosen significance level of 0.05. So we're going to reject the null hypothesis if the probability of observing a result at least as extreme as the one that we actually got is 5%, 0.05 or less. And so if we reject the null hypothesis, we can also describe the difference between samples or the relationship or whatever we're testing for um, as statistically significant. However, note that statistical significance just tells us the probability of observing the effect if the hypothesis is true. It does not tell us whether the effect itself is important. This is where that effect size comes in. The difference between the groups, the strength of the relationship. You need to use your judgment to determine whether this effect, how big it is, is actually meaningful or important in the real world. Because statistical significance is a function both of the size of the effect, but also the size of sample, the, the amount of sample you have, the number of samples. And so, in fact, tiny differences can become statistically significant even, as long as you have very large sample sizes. If we fail to reject the null hypothesis because the p-value is larger than 0.05, it's not correct to say the samples are the same we should say that there is no significant difference between them. Well, what does this really mean? Something being not significant basically means that the effect is un uncertain or unclear. Group A could be bigger, but we can't rule out group B actually being bigger. Variable Y could actually could increase as variable X increases, but we can't rule it out decreasing instead. Our sort of, our confidence level overlap zero. So the effect could be in one direction, but it could be zero or in the other direction. So, as I said, we can never prove the null hypothesis. The chance that our two groups are actually not different at all to infinite number of decimal places is wrong. One of them is bigger than the other. There is a relationship in some direction or another. And so when we have a not significant statistical result, it just means that we're unclear or uncertain about the direction of, of that effect, really. So there's always going to be some difference or relationship. We can never prove or accept the null hypothesis. We can simply not reject it, which means that we're not really certain about what's going on with the, with the data, given the sample size that we have.